Uh, brother, I'm going to have you open with prayer, and then I'm going to have you close. So we'll just pass it to you. So let us come to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus, thanking you, Lord, for this opportunity to see a need for a Savior. I plead the blood of Jesus over every spirit, soul, and body here, and I ask you, Lord, to give each soul rest here from their habits of sin, including mine. I ask you, Lord, to pull out your mercy, your grace, your power, your might, and your spirit, and to impart it to each and every soul in this room, that you, Father God, would allow us to be able to do your good purpose and your will. And in Jesus' name, I ask you, Lord, to illuminate our minds to see the truth and give us the strength to follow it. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord Jesus, I'd like to ask you to bless everybody's families tonight. Make sure they stay safe and unharmed from any other people out there who wants to hurt them and do any other kind of crimes towards anybody's family just because they're locked up and can't do nothing about it until they get out to make sure that they can take care of them again. And I say that because my wife's out there and I can't do nothing about it. And I felt like I needed to come up here and speak on everybody's behalf on that. So, Jesus, please make sure everybody's families are okay and stuff, because I hope mine is. Amen. I don't believe in excuses. <clears throat> However, I believe in understanding. I uh, was raised in a holiness home. Amen. Both of my parents are ministers, and they raised me in the love of Christ. And uh, I had some bad experiences in church, though. Mm. Church member uh, molested me. Mm. I, I was violated. So uh, my view of God was distorted. When he told me about the bus driver at my church molesting him, I said, John, if you'd have told me uh, 10, 20 years ago, if he'd have told me, you'd have been coming to prison to, me, to visit me. So I see God's mercy that dad is not in jail for killing this rascal that I trusted. See, and so he did something for me by not self-disclosing. And the shame that he battled with came out with misplaced aggression. And, and, and all the battles he felt, he, he, he was fighting inside that he couldn't share with nobody. So he turned to drugs and, and things that uh, keep you entertained in another sphere. And that's where he went, that's the way he went. And, and that's where a lot of young people go. It killed my spirit and I began to uh, not have any love for myself, I had low self-esteem, and I, I had problems with authority immediately. I uh, couldn't trust nobody. I couldn't understand the, the emotions with being uh, abused like that. And, you know, so I grew up full of rage and anger for many years. Say that I was bound by rage. I was bound by lust because that experience produced a lust in me, man, that was so foul. Amen. And I started manipulating women. I started running game, playing myself, you know, uh, got addicted to drugs, alcohol. And uh, those things were my God. I feel my you. pistols, my, 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 my Hennessy, my, my drink, my, my drugs, the women, those were my God. Mm. Jesus wasn't my God. And I was raised that Jesus is God. He ain't part God, he all God. My anger was towards Christians, whoever, man. I had no peace in me. I had no uh, sense of calmness in me. Uh, but keep in mind, I had loving parents. So I, I, I've witnessed many good moments with having six sisters and three brothers and. You know, I, I, I saw a lot of love. I, I saw a lot of good times, but on the inside, it was just chaos. He was locked in in the way he was going. 
and it was looked like he wasn't going to change. But prayer, how many know prayer changes things? Prayer changed things. Brother, my testimony is this. I shot a Christian in the head. The Christian lived and said, I forgive you. Mm. I was so against God, that was, brother. That was powerful. We were devastated. We never had anyone in our family in prison before or in jail or, or in that type of trouble before. So we were totally, even though we Christians, we were devastated. Didn't know how to handle that. So filled and bound with rage, man, anger. And see, God allowed, he didn't do it, but he allowed me to make those bad choices, man, because he created us with free will. Amen. I felt like a failure. I felt like somewhere I failed. I didn't know where it was, but I, I just felt like I had failed my son. And then I was afraid. And then uh, the police came to our home and they wanted to know if I knew where he was. And I told him, yes, I think he's gone back to West Virginia where his grandmother lived. And uh, I was praying, Lord, please don't let them hurt my son. And he made it to West Virginia, and he was just where I told him he was. And what they did, they had like a SWAT team, and they was ready for him. But God didn't let them hurt him. So they brought him back to Indiana, and it was quite a while before we saw him. Quite a while. But the good part, <laughs> That's the sad part, that's the tear-jerking part. But the good part is that he began to change in prison. See, so the thing is, I made choices, man, that I live with regret to this day. Took me five years to forgive myself by God's grace. Amen. But I want you to know that victim, that Christian, said to me, I forgive you. Amen. The Praise light God. came on. For real. The light came on. When you get broken, your ears come open for help, and you can hear the still, small voice of God. When I, when I was told, I forgive you, mm. man, it broke me. Amen. I realized I deserve hell, man. I deserve hell. Jesus want me. Jesus want to forgive me. Amen. You know, I, I couldn't understand that, but I got honest with myself in the county jail. You got I said, I can't blame my parents. I can't blame uh, people that abused me when I was seven years yeah. old. Uh, uh, I can't blame anyone, man. It's me. It's my fault. And when I did that, God began to mature me. You know, God began to show me more about his love for me. And see, I, I want to encourage people to believe beyond your feelings. Amen. See, I want you, I want to encourage people to confess beyond your feelings. We walk by faith, not we, by sight. Th thank you, brother. Amen. Because I'm going to tell you something. If I walk by feelings, <laughs> I won't be here. When I didn't see the best in myself, when I couldn't see, when I was blind, Jesus always saw my potential. He always saw me on the mountaintop. He always saw me in victory, although I was in the valley, although I was a lost soul, I was living in sin. He saw me better than that. And I thank him for that, man. I thank him because even when I didn't see it, through the years, he gave me hints that you're better than this. Even though I didn't come out of it, there was times I was drunk, man, and I would just start crying, crying and crying and crying, man, knowing that I needed Jesus. But I can't talk about this shame. I can't talk about this secret. He saw the best in me. My son sings a song uh, entitled, he saw the best in me when others saw the worst in me. 
anyone that feels like they're damaged goods, like nobody cares, I've ruined my life, I've been told that I'm no good, I'm stupid, can't do anything right, that Jesus sees the best in you. That's why he created you. You're worth something. How many to believe? You. You're worth something. To you. Hallelujah. How many believe that God saw the best in you while you was in your sin? Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. I get stirred up about that. Yeah. Hallelujah, because I know what he's done for me. Hallelujah. 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 My soul cries out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He saw the best in me. Mm. When everyone else around could only see the worst in me. He said, Come on, John, take your time. Oh, Lord, my Lord. He saw the best. Hallelujah. Yes, he did. When everyone else around could only see the worst in me. Oh, oh, oh my Jesus, he saw the best in me. Yeah. Hallelujah. When everyone else around could only My elementary teacher told me that I wasn't going to be nothing. She told me that it ain't no hope for me. But Jesus saw. Hallelujah. When I didn't see, Jesus saw. Hallelujah. 
I thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. You're worthy to be praised. Taking my son, turning him around, giving my heart that's full of love for Jesus Christ and causing him to care for others. And it's just marvelous. It's just, we visited him last Sunday and as we were sitting there talking to him, I didn't feel like I was in a prison. Just talking to him, he's so upbeat, he's so excited. And just talking to him, it just seemed like the prison walls melted away. And we were just having just a, a family discussion. And I give God praise for that. It's been 12 years that John has been incarcerated. But I'm believing God to work a miracle for him that he can get out while Dad and I are still alive. I'm 67 years old. And I'm just believing God to work a miracle. And I'm proud of him. I'm always just grateful. It took this, he told his mother, it took this to get him on the right track and keeping him in his lane. See, you can get, tr you can get in trouble if you get, out of, if you get out of your lane, but he's in his lane and Jesus is helping him to stay in his lane. And so I'm proud of him, God bless. We want to get you out and downstairs and get your bags and tell us our time is really, really gone. In fact, I'm looking at zeros all the way across the screen. Technically, I have no time. But a preacher and a microphone are a dangerous combination. So for what I'm about to do to you, I apologize. We're going to do it in just two minutes. I'm going to bring you a message from the graveyard. It won't be long. It comes from 2 Kings chapter 13. I'm going to read just 20 and 21. The Bible says, Then Elisha died. And they buried him, and the raiding bands of Moab invaded the land at the spring of the year. So it was that they were burying a man, that suddenly they spied a band of Moabite raiders, and they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. I want you to get the picture. Spring was a time of year when the Moabites, who were first cousins to the Israelites, always invaded the land. Every spring, like crockwork, they would come in and invade. And so you're always on the lookout for Moabite raiders. Evidently, there's a funeral. Now, the great prophet Elisha had just died. They hadn't had a chance to close the tomb in, so you still got this open hole. It's a sad funeral procession. Spring, flowers, sunny skies, but nobody's paying attention to that because it's a funeral. So as they move along, off in the distance, they spy a band of Moabite raiders. I want you to get the picture. These guys are coming to kill. The swords are flashing, the shields, they've got spears. And so the funeral train is thrown into this, this frenzy we got to run for our lives. So what do we do with this body? Well, here's a hole. Let's throw them in a hole and run for our lives. And that's precisely what they do. But the Bible says when they throw this dead body into the hole and his body touches the body of Elisha, he revives and stands on his feet. Now you got to get the picture. Because they just threw a dead body in a hole. I've done 117 funerals. 
at my last church. My last church was 2,142 members in Manhattan, New York. I did 117 funerals. And every one of those people that I put down in the ground is still in the ground. Amen. Amen. That's the way it's supposed to be until Jesus comes back and resurrects. You're supposed to, if you get put down, you're supposed to stay down. Amen. 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 <laughs> but the Bible says when this fella got put in a hole, he jumped back up. Now, can you imagine the visual? That's like a sci-fi movie. You got, you got a band of Moabite raiders rushing into attack, a band of Israelites rushing away, and this guy jumps up out of the hole. War over. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you know, when, when, when God's got to raise up dead people to fight against you, it's time to stop fighting, don't you think? <laughs> but the message from the graveyard really is this, because my time is gone. You're never too dead to be revived by Jesus. You, you may look at your life and say, my rap sheet is pretty long. I've, I've seen, you know, you ever do stuff, you get on your own nerves? Come on, tell the truth. Yep, you know, sometimes you do stuff, you say, what? You know, what, what was I thinking? Can I spell stupid? Did I invent stupid? Huh? You just, you, you know, you make yourself sick. How could I be so dumb? You know, the Bible says one of my favorite texts, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Even though you're pointing your finger at yourself, when you come to Jesus, he says, finger pointing is done. No condemnation. You can't be too dead for Jesus. He can revive the deadest soul. He says, he that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Basically, Christ says, if you've got enough sense, if you've got enough sense to call, I've got enough love to answer. Amen? So free yourself. Free yourself from your own guilt. Free yourself from your own past. Because in Jesus, you've only got a future. Amen? Amen. And you're never too far gone. You're never too dead. You've never gone too far. You've not done too much. He doesn't care where you've been, what you've done, how many times you've done it. He says, I love you with an everlasting love. And he didn't wait for you to get straight to come to him. He went looking for you. Amen? So give it to Jesus. Whatever it is, give it all to Jesus. He can carry it. And if necessary, he can carry you. Even if you carry in a few extra pounds, he can carry you. <laughs> I guarantee. God bless you.